There are 14 games on Tuesday, so that's what we're going to talk about. We'll preview them, look at the injury updates, talk about guys that you might want to add that even though there's 14 games on, you still might want to start them. I don't know. We'll find out. Mike Bolton, anything interesting? Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and my blood is not off the rack. I'm also a lead fantasy, or the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball, on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That is linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy basketball your first listen every day we are free and we're available on all platforms so double bang it thumb it up subscribe if you haven't and leave comments down below we're here we're ready to talk about tuesday in the nba there are an enormous an inordinate amount of games 14 of them on that is every team except for brooklyn and except for cleveland that is playing on tuesday and while that is technically not a streaming day that is true but as you will see there are going to be a million blokes that get ruled out There are going to be a random swathe of players who actually become top 100, top 70 guys who you could actually use because we don't have many streaming days this week. So like, yeah, we can add someone on Tuesday and Wednesday. Oh, sorry, Wednesday, Thursday. And we do want to cap those days out as much as possible. But if you've got a fringe back-end player that sits on your bench or even your 10th best guy or whatever, you might find someone who might have top 50 numbers for Tuesday and for Wednesday as well, and then for Friday because of fake injuries everywhere. So don't be completely just dismissing this day. There are options out there of guys available that might be significant enough upgrades that even though you aren't getting the extra game because you can't find the extra game anywhere apart from Tuesday, apart Wednesday, Thursday, that adding that player I, I think works. Again, get the extra games are more important on Wednesday, Thursday. But an upgrade on a Tuesday or an upgrade on Friday or an upgrade on Sunday is not going to be the worst move or the worst decision. First game. Philadelphia, they're hosting the Detroit Pistons. What's happening in this one? Well, that's always a good question, isn't it? Let's find out. Um, What are we looking at in this one? Because in terms of schedules, right? Every team plays Friday, Sunday this week. Every team that I talk about here plays Tuesday. So I'm just going to be highlighting what other days they play, really. Detroit plays Thursday. Philadelphia does not play on Wednesday, Thursday. They're one of a handful of teams that does not play across that time. There are four teams that don't play Wednesday or Thursday. Philadelphia is one of them. Cade has been upgraded to questionable. That left knee injury management, wow. He's managed it well enough. I just don't understand mucking around with this stuff. Why we just, like, just, he's either in or he's out. What do, what what are you actually doing? Like Jalen Duran missed the last game for was an ankle problem? Something. I don't know. I just yeah, I hard to keep up with the lies, to be fair. So he's not on the injury report here, Duran. Um J- oh, Ivan Fournier is probable. Cool. He missed the last game with knee soreness. And then we've got all of the Sixers guys. Now there is something interesting here. Yes, we saw guys rest for the Sixers last game on the back to back, but they haven't been ruled probable. So Embiid and Lowry are not probable. They're questionable. All right. Toby Harris has missed the last three. He's questionable. Tyrese Maxey played in the back-to-back, including a double overtime double overtime against the Spurs. He's questionable. But almost most interesting is the wave pool. De'Anthony Melton has been upgraded to questionable. So that is five questionable tags here on guys. And given that it's against nobody, oh, who knows whether... Embiid plays or, or Maxi plays, given the, the big minutes he played, like the 50-odd minutes he played on Sunday? I, I don't know. We do want to watch Chemezi Metu for Detroit. Last game, he slid into the starting lineups because Tosan Ebwamwan was out. I'm guessing he was out because of G League contract rules, so I'm not sure whether Ebwamwan returns in this one. He probably does. 
Um, but Metu has been putting up good numbers anyway. And then Kelly Oubre is doing everything. But what if all of these guys play? Maxi, Lowry, Harris, Embiid, and Melton. Where does Zubre get 40 minutes? Does he get these shots? Probably not, yeah? So we need to see how they use him. Jaden Ivey does get boosts. He's been bad a lot of the time, but there is a boost opportunity. But maybe if Cade plays, he doesn't get it. I don't know. And then Kyle Lowry gets the boost mainly because he's starting, but a lot of this could be cut off with a million different guys potentially returning here for Philadelphia. Indiana and Toronto is our next game. Some interesting stuff on the schedule. The Pacers, much like the Sixers, do not play Wednesday or Thursday, whereas the Raptors go on Wednesday. Manuel quickly is out resting, right? So that's important. What's also important is I believe that then means that Kelly Olynyk and Rowan Barrett will probably sit on Wednesday for resting purposes and maybe even Gaz Trent, maybe Bruce Brown. Certainly Olynyk and Barrett have got to be almost definite zeros on Wednesday. Probably Trent as well. We know quickly is out. Um, Grady Dick, he is questionable with his groin issue. And DJ Carton remains out. For the Pacers, we got big minutes last game from Aaron Neesmith. I don't see huge value in Neesmith, especially with no quality game coming up. Um, and then Bruce Brown, I want to watch, mainly because like his minutes have been all over the shop. So paying attention a little bit to how they're using him. And then with Quickly out, do we get a little bit more there from him? Do they start uh, Freeman Liberty and then give a little bit boost to Bruce Brown as a secondary ball handler? I'm not sure. In Indiana, Timothy John McConnell's been getting the boost. He actually played a ton of minutes last game, which was very, very interesting. And then Gaz Trent, with no quickly, we're going to see more shots for Gaza, and that makes him a very op- uh, useful option. You could also throw in a Freeman Liberty in that zone as well. Um, and the other guards, yeah, maybe it's a war who mainly plays as a forward, but yeah, they're going to be pretty messy, I'm guessing here. Down the stretch, the old Toronto Raptors. Dallas taking on the Charlotte Hornets in this one. Um... Very interesting game, this one. The reason I say it's interesting is this is a first of a back-to-back for Dallas. They play Wednesday, as does Charlotte. Remember how I'm going to refer to They both play on the Wednesday. So I thought there was a massive chance here that Dallas would just sit either Kyrie or Luka. Their, their beat reporters have been talking a lot about the load that's built up on Kyrie and Luka and saying that there's going to be rest days coming, and they've been shocked that Kyrie hasn't got one yet. So this seemed to me to be the perfect opportunity for Kyrie to sit a game. But no, he's not on the injury report. So I guess, I guess they're playing. I I don't. Again, it's Charlotte. Like, can they not handle it? If if they don't like, I don't know if one of them isn't playing. I'm not really sure. Now the Mavericks are obviously still in somewhat of a seeding battle, but they are two games behind the Clippers, and they're two games ahead of the Suns and Pelicans. So they've got a pretty strong hold on this, and you think they can handle the Hornets? just as a general rule, with one of those guys out. Because then after that, they play the Hawks on Wednesday, then the Celtics, who won't probably be trying, then the Hornets, uh, sorry, then the, um, uh, sorry, wrong team. That's the the Charlotte schedule. Dallas's schedule, more importantly. They play the Heat, then the Pistons and the Thunder. Then the Heat and the Thunder are still probably going to be trying for stuff at that point. So I don't know. We'll see what happens with them. They've got the Detroit game where those guys can rest as well. But yeah, very interesting they're not doing that. Lively remains out. Kleber is questionable. He'll sit one of the back-to-back, so basically, definitely this game. And Josh Green is doubtful. Amari Bailey, questionable for the Charlotte Hornets. Um, It shouldn't matter, but it does, because we don't know who's going to be in or who is going to be out. What is on my radar? Dante Exum has been getting more minutes lately. I thought there was a chance for big minutes here for Exum because I thought Kyrie might sit, but no. So we just do still watch Exum to see how he fits in with um, with Hardaway, with Jaden Hardy, with uh, Derek Jones in terms of minutes. And then for Charlotte, we're getting a ton out of Grant Williams. Yes, it's against his former team. Will he start at center again? Probably. He's playing like 37 minutes a night, but that's something to watch. In terms of guys getting boosted, PJ Washington's getting boosted against his former team, but not just his former team. He's been boosted every game. He's playing like 36 minutes, 37 minutes a night, and a lot more shots and a lot more value. And on the Charlotte side, Davis Bertans is getting boosted. For some reason, he's getting a lot of steals. He's playing 23 minutes a night, and he's hitting threes. Now, he can very easily have four points with one three, and that's it. And it's useless. But in terms of a guy that's available everywhere, there's a little bit of sneaky value there for old mate Davis Bertans. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you are hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That is why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. 
It's not just another job board. LinkedIn has access to a vast network of over 1 billion, with a B, 1 billion professionals. That's like, what, one-eighth of the world's population on LinkedIn? Seems a lot, but it's what's happening. That gives you the best opportunity to find the right person for your job. Small business owners will go and tell you. If you just sit them down quietly and go, hey, can you tell me about LinkedIn jobs? This is what they'll say. They will say that they find a qualified candidate for their job within 24 hours, 86% of the time. And you'll say, that's a remarkably specific statistic. And you go, yeah, it's not just me that's 86% of the time. It's the broad range of LinkedIn jobs users, meaning that most of the time, you're going to get someone good to get in there to apply for your job. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing many hats, even if it's not a hat company. You've got so many things you need to do at LinkedIn. So helping you get the right people in is paramount. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That is locked on, uh, LinkedIn, sorry, it's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Let's go through to the next one after Dallas and Charlotte. Uh, it's Boston and Milwaukee. Hmm, very interesting. Let's see what happens here with um, the Celtics who play again on Thursday and the Bucks go on Wednesday, so they're going to back-to-back. For the Boston load managers, where are we at with their um, their resting and their situation? Because we know that there are going to be guys that are out. Now, Jason Tatum rested the last game. He returns. And then both Puzingas and Horford are listed questionable. They've got the Thursday, Friday back-to-back coming up where they're going to be sitting a lot of different guys. So I would suggest that one of Porzingis and Horford, and I don't think it's going to be Horford that plays here, one of these guys sits in this game, maybe both. Maybe both. So be aware of that. Giannis is questionable for the Bucks, who obviously need to win considering how bad they are. And Middleton with his mouth trauma is probable, and Patrick Beverly is probable as well, while Marjon Beauchamp is out. In terms of where the standings sit in this one, like we know, the Magic or the Milwaukee Bucks keep losing. They are a one game ahead of the Magic for the two seed. The Knicks are also one game behind them. The Cavs are one and a half games behind them. They could conceivably, considering how bad they are, Milwaukee, they could conceivably fall to the five. That seems inconceivable, but it is actually possible. If they lose two, three more games here, the Magic, Knicks, and Cavs keep winning. Well, they're done. The Bucks, like they are, wait. It is crazy how bad they are. What have they? What's the the number here? They've lost four in a row, and they've lost six of their last seven. Dreadful. They go Boston, Orlando, OKC, Orlando. The Magic almost have their own their, their destiny in their own hands. The Magic win both those games, and they're ahead of Milwaukee. Wow, what a crazy scenario that is. Anyway, I expect that even with the Celtics. You know, not listing guards there that Peyton Pritchard will be interesting because we'll see some limitations or some just some wacky lineups as they do nothing, literally nothing to play for. On the Bucks side, we've seen Bobby Portis get prioritized at times over Brook Lopez, other times over Leaky Beasley. So we'll see how uh, Glenn Rivers, does. it's working well for him. It's, it's going great. So we'll see exactly how he uses Portis here. In terms of getting boosted, like Slam and Sammy Hauser will probably get a boost. So would Luke Cornett, uh, maybe even Xavier Tillman with those big man absences. And then Pat Connaughton again, extremely weirdly gets boosts and a lot of minutes. He doesn't do anything with them, but that is the Glenn Rivers way. Let's talk Miami and Atlanta. Both of these teams have got the game on Wednesday during this week. Terry Rozier said after the last game, he shouldn't have played with his neck injury. So I'm going to suggest that this questionable tag on Rozier is probably more closer to a doubtful tag. They've listed as they love to do. They love to tell us the guys are playing or the guys are probable. Cool, like uh, every five minutes. Bam is probable. Rob- Duncan Robinson's probable. Nikola Jovic is probable. And Kevin Love is probable. Cool. So they're playing. We got the news that Trey Young is back and doing some practice. He won't play in this game, but it does appear that we'll get Trey back for the plane and maybe one regular season game. A Kongwu, no real update on that. They've been very, very cagey. The first game that he sat out, they said, yeah, it's just knee injury maintenance. You want to tell us about that? No. And then he hasn't played since. What a terrible end to the season. And then Adrian Griffin, you want to talk about confusing seasons. There has not been a more confusing season in the NBA than AJ Griffin. For um, the Heat, Tyler Hero is still coming off the bench, but I would imagine if Rogier does not play, that Hero would start. Actually, even if Rogier plays, the way that Duncan Robinson's going, I think Hero probably retakes over there. And I just keep wanting to watch DeAndre Hunter because A, I hate myself, but also just to get a better idea of what we can do with Hunter. And the thing we do with him is just not care about him at all after these final three games are done. 
Guys getting boosted. We saw a big boost for Caleb Martin last game. Whether that is something that holds, I don't know, but he is prioritized over Highsmith and Huckers at the moment. And then Bruno Fernando gets that boost coming off the Hawks bench because a Kongwu is allegedly dead. On to the next game. It is Washington and Minnesota. Um, the Wizards. They don't have a quality game, so no Wednesday, Thursday for them, whereas the uh, Wolves game in the middle of the week is on Wednesday. In terms of updates, I listed Kyle Kuzma personally on my own injury report, which you know, is something for me to read. I had Kyle Kuzma as, question, as doubtful, but the, the Wizards decided in their infinite wisdom that they would put him as questionable. Now, Kuzma has played one game out of the last five. It was a 39-minute game against the Lakers. Who's to say whether he played that one because it was only against the Lakers? I don't know. Seems relatively innocuous that that might happen, but yeah, yeah, just completely random stuff that he was able to be fit and healthy for that one, but none of the other ones. I honestly just don't think Kuzma's going to play any of these remaining games, but I don't know. I don't know. And I wish I didn't care, but I have to. John Davis, I didn't think would play after leaving the last game, but they've listed him questionable. They've actually trust, uh, chucked Tristan Vukcevic onto the injury report as questionable, Rashawn Holmes as questionable, and Anthony Gill as questionable. So your understanding of the center rotation is terrible because mine is as well and everybody else's. is. All three center candidates are questionable. And the other guy that could play is the sandwich, Patrick Baldwin, who was great last game, but also played seven minutes the game before. It's a mess, and it's very hard to know what's going on. We did get news that Carl Anthony Towns could be returning soon. He's starting to do some work. He won't play here. I would imagine maybe he gets one regular season game in. Maybe. But even then, I think that's a big stretch. For the Wizards, Denny Avdia has been playing much better of late. He's getting a lot of minutes as well. His minutes run is ridiculous. 39 against Detroit, 38 against Miami, 39 against the Bucks, 22 in that game against the Lakers. He left with a migraine, then 39 and 41. You probably don't need to be playing him that much, to be honest. I don't really know what we're getting out of it, but it's also one of those things. Someone left a comment, man, why do you hate Denny so much? You never talk about his numbers. If someone else was doing this, you'd be saying how great it is. The reason that I'm not, look, I've, I've talked about Denny plenty. Um, I think he's fine. He's established himself as a solid enough rotation back end starter sort of a guy. But these minutes on this terrible team, you're playing 40 a night, it's really just boosting a lot of stuff. But none of this stuff is real at all. Like, it just isn't. And while, again, Denny looks solid enough, he's fine as a, as a, he, he's fine as a starter on a, or bad team, maybe a fifth starter on a solid team. I don't know. But nothing that's happened over the last six to eight weeks for Denny makes me go, yeah, here we go. This guy's figured it out. Big star sort of stuff. I don't really see that for him. So there you go. For the Wolves, Nas Reed. When he was coming off the bench, even with Towns out, a little mid. Now that he's starting, everything's been much, much better, and it has really impacted someone like Kyle Anderson. Well, Tristan Vukcevic, is being, he has been getting boosted, and now that he's on the injury report and then Holmes and Gill are questionable, I don't know, but I've liked what I've seen. And then we've also seen some boosts from Nikhil Alexander-Walker. They did ramp a little bit of Conley's minutes down after that really weird sort of boost that he got, but Conley's uh, production has fallen 25 and 26 minutes the last two games. And you can see it in potentially another easy victory here that they do pull Conley back and then Alexander-Walker's minutes step back up. Knicks, Bulls. All right. Um... What are we looking at here? Just seeing there's a note here from the Celtics. They've uh, converted Nemeas Keita into a uh, full t- full-time contract. Good for them. Yeah, so yeah, Keita converted. That means he can play in the playoffs. Maybe he gets a minute here down the stretch. We're talking Knicks-Bulls, though. Both of these teams' bonus game this week is on Thursday. In terms of injuries, the Bulls do have Alex Caruso listed officially as questionable, but they also chucked... Old mate Ayo Dusumu on the list is questionable, while Kobe White is probable. For the Knicks, or Julian Phillips is out for the Bulls. For the Knicks, Boyan Bogdanovich is probable as well. For the Knicks, we barely saw Precious Achua last game. He was completely pushed out of the rotation. He got like five minutes. And I don't really know how much changes in this one. It was just Robinson and Hartenstein with no Precious at the five or at the four at all. And this Bulls team is tiny. So I'm not really sure he gets out there and does that either. Well, for the Bulls, they started Javante Green in place of Alex Caruso. They honestly could do it again, even if Caruso returns. But they could also just play Green 27 off the bench as a really solid defensive forward type player. So we need to watch him. Isaiah Hartenstein gets the boost because of the minimization of Achua. And then we did see some crossover between Andre Drummond and Nikola Vucevic last game. Vuce has been bad the last couple. Drummond has pushed over 20 minutes in three straight games. And if we do have a scenario with Caruso is out again, 
that actually will help um, Drummond get a few extra minutes and be at least a rebound streamer for you. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Game Time app. Tickets, yeah? We love going to events. They're fun. We spend our time at work, at school, doing the things that are needed, and then we want to reward ourselves. But why would you want to deal with a frustrating process in buying tickets? I've had that process so many times with so many sites, and it's annoying. And it sometimes dissuades you. There's a site that I go to buy tickets sometimes, and I go there and they go, sorry, we've blocked your card. I go, oh, excuse me, why is that? Oh, no reason, just can't use that one. Ah, oh, cool, sick. Love that for me. Now I can't do anything about it. But when I go to game time, well, it's just awesome. It is just an easy process. And now they're actually also an authorized marketplace for Major League Baseball. So the tickets are even faster and easier. The prices on the Game Time app also actually go down the closer you get to the first pitch. So go ahead there and check out their last minute deals. You've got a chance to save up to 60% on buying last minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, and theater. The Flash deals got exclusive in app deals. They'll pop them up on your screen and go, bang, look at this. What do you reckon? Tickets? You want to go? And you go, yeah, absolutely. Game time. That sounds like a really, really good idea. Thank you for telling me about it. They've got all the in pricing, zone deals, so many different things. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create the account, and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, all right. The eighth game of the day is the San Antonio Spurs and the Memphis Grizzlies. What an absolute cracking banger this is going to be. What a game we have got in store for us here. Spurs, Grizzlies. Um, In terms of the schedule, both teams will obviously play Tuesday, but they've got the back-to-back Tuesday, Wednesday, which is honestly going to be make all of this a nightmare. Now, the... When I created this graphic, I didn't actually know what the injury reports for these teams were. I guessed at it. So let's see how accurate I was. I said I think Keldon Johnson's going to be out. Keldon Johnson is out, so that is a W. I don't think Johnson's back this season, the old horse. Uh, Chetty Osman, I suggested he would be out. He is out. What else has happened? Oh, Don Barlow, I said, was questionable, but he is actually out as well. All right. Missed that one. On the Grizzly side, you will be stunned and shocked and appalled. An absolutely unbelievable occurrence that Jaron Jackson is, in fact, out. Desmond Bain is, in fact, out. We nailed those two. Um... Santi Aldama is out. The Duck, Luke Kennard, is out. I had all these guys listed doubtful. Now, Jake LaRavia is doubtful. I had him questionable, so there you go. I didn't know he'd be sitting. Lamar Stevens is doubtful after he missed the last game. Sick, so he's probably not going to play. John Conchar is listed out. Let's just say that his season's over. Why are we even mucking around with this? I don't understand it. He is not going to play. I don't get what we're doing here. Um, Brandon Clark is not on the injury report. So, I thought, well, he's going to rest one of these games, Clarkie. So it means he's playing on Tuesday and probably sitting out on Wednesday is my guess for him. Marcus Smart, on the 22nd of February, the Grizzlies put out an injury report saying that he would be reevaluated in three weeks and updates would be provided as appropriate. Now, that reevaluation date was three and a half weeks ago. So I'm going to guess that they found that the update was not appropriate to share with anybody and they just refused to tell us, which is again why I said about the Desmond Bain scenario with everything they've done all season with injuries, like I would be dropping him. I don't think he is returning. And what Bain, for absolutely no reason, came back, played four games, and now he's out again. So you might tell me that, Josh, you cost me. You told me to drop Desmond Bain. Um, you're an absolute wanker. Why would you say that? You got it wrong. Just admit you're wrong. Yeah, cool. But also, I wasn't wrong because like, he came back. Uh, I was, but he came back. He played four games. He's out again. And it's just one of those things where process over results. Like, it made absolutely no sense for him to return like any other player here. And now we're seeing all this foolishness. And just again, coincidentally, Jaron Jackson hit the 65-game mark. Hasn't played since. And I wonder if that'll be the case all the way through here. Sick. What a great time it is. For the Spurs, Bubbles Champagne. There are big opportunities. There are big minutes. I actually really like having him for the rest of this season now. For the Grizzlies, my calculation, now again, I don't know. I am working off incomplete information, but this is the best information you're going to find. Jordan Goodwin, I think, has got one game left that he has to sit out. It won't be this one, but I also don't know. 
but I want to see him. Sandro Mamakulishvili will probably have to start with Kalden out, I'm guessing, and that means a big boost for him. And then the other one who's probably going to get a boost here is Trey Jemison, who also, I believe, has one more game left that he has to sit, but I could also be wrong on that and that they have timed it perfectly and these guys will run all the way through. But there is no tracker on this. Nobody cares enough to tell us. So I've been trying to do some little, you know, um, back alley, speakeasy style calculations, but maybe I'm, I'm off on it. But for this one, they have to play. They have to, because there's just nobody else. Um, the next game, we look at Orlando and Houston, a little bit less messy in terms of injuries. On the Magic side, they play Wednesday. The Rockets play Thursday. Franz Wagner hurt his ankle last game. I thought for sure he wouldn't be available to play in this one, but they have listed him questionable, so he still may not play. While back spasm legend John Isaac, who has dicked us twice already with the Friday no-show, then the five-minute Sunday, he is questionable again. Like, we are just definitely not trusting him yet. Like, we're not trusting him to play in this one whatsoever. Now, this is the first game of a back-to-back for Orlando. Um, and Marco Fultz is not listed on the injury report, meaning we think he's going to play, but probably doesn't play on Wednesday would be the guess there. But as you know, with all this stuff, it's like guarding nuclear launch codes, like whether these guys are going to play or not. Caleb Houston does return for Orlando, not to say that he'd play, but I'd imagine if Isaac or Franz is out, then Houston will play. Uh, while the wild thing is out for Houston. Now, Houston's officially out of the playoff mix and play in mix. So a lot of people will just take that to mean that they think they're going to shut down a bunch of guys. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that that means that Van Vliet's sitting. I don't think that that means that Brooks is sitting. Um, I, well, obviously, I don't think it means that Whitmore or Men or Jabari. I don't think anything changes really for the Rockets. I could be wrong. I don't I don't think that happens for them. We'll find out. Fultz has been playing much better. And now that he's not on the injury report in this one, maybe we get an opportunity. What if he actually plays through? It'd be weird to me that again. Why would he play against Houston and then sit against Milwaukee when they need to build, beat Milwaukee to get the two seed? I don't know. But we'll, maybe they play him on the back-to-back. I'm not sure, but we need to watch it. We also need to watch a man Thompson, who I am not convinced, as much as I love him, I'm not convinced that he is a must-roster player through this week. With Cam Whitmore back, a man's minutes are down. A man has not hit 30 minutes since the 29th of March, which was the last game that Whitmore missed. He played 20 minutes, 25, 29.7, missed a game, and then ejected after seven. So 29.7 is close enough, but yeah, his minutes just aren't there. They're good, and we still probably hold, but also his production hasn't been good. So yeah, I, I wouldn't be as quick to label him absolute must at the moment. In terms of guys getting boosted, I think we get a little bit more out of Gaz Harris in this one, but I'm also not certain. That's more if Franz is out. And then Cam Whitmore continues to get that boost in terms of being that usage bloke coming off the bench. The Kings taking on the Oklahoma City Thunder. Cool. Got that. Uh, this one game here. And we got some interesting injury updates in this one as well. Mainly, well, actually, we'll talk schedule. The Kings play Thursday, the Thunder play Wednesday, but Shea Gildas Alexander is not on the injury report. Now, there is always, we have these always doubts, like, oh, he's not on the injury report. What if it was a mistake? We've seen that happen many times. The Thunder usually don't make those mistakes. What the Thunder is more likely to do is rule a bloke out, like today, and then actually upgrade him the next morning and he's available to play. They've done that many times. So, like, Gordon Haywood is more likely to play, I think, than Shea is likely to sit. Haywood is out. Shea is in. Jalen Williams, the Bronco, is questionable. Now, again, they do play a back-to-back. So they play on Wednesday. So maybe Shea plays one and sits one of them as well. For the Kings, they also chucked Keegan Murray onto the injury report, sort of out of nowhere, with a calf issue. He's questionable. Colby Jones. Colby Jones. That's yeah, a real player. Second-round pick. Barely played all season, but last game, popped up. 23 minutes. Big defensive stats. Played minutes over Keon Ellis and Harrison Barnes, who absolutely sucks. So Colby, I'm not saying he's an ad, but let's watch this one. Well, last game, Aaron Wiggins was crazy. Unbelievably good. And if Jalen Williams is out, then Aaron Wiggins probably gets another start. But they've just rotated guys like Joe and Wiggins and Haywood and Pig Williams and a bunch of different guys through there. So I'm not going to have supreme confidence, but I do want to watch it. Davion Mitchell is getting some boost in Sacramento. Look, but it easily could turn back and Keon Ellis starts. We know what Mike Brown does, right? If you start the game out and shoot well or play well for the first five minutes, well, you'll play 30 minutes. If you miss your first three shots, you'll get benched. It happens to Herder. It's happened to Murray. It's happened to Ellis. It's happened to um, anyone. Duarte, a million different guys. Barnes, the only guys that doesn't happen to are Fox and Sabonis. So while I can tell you here that Davion Mitchell gets a boost and Colby Jones might do more, 
If Keon Ellis hits two shots in five minutes, well, he's playing 30 minutes. That's how Mike Brown runs. And you might criticize it, but whatever. That's what he is. Josh Kitty's also been getting boosts in Oklahoma City, um, but with Shea back, we'll see what that does. But yeah, his recent production has been very, very good. And I think we'll continue to be pretty strong. Denver and Utah. This is a back-to-back for Denver. I have some very big questions about what they've done with their injury report. You are playing a Utah Jazz team that does refuses to win. They are sitting everybody. They have lost 12 in a row, I believe it is. Denver is on the first game of a back-to-back. Uh, the Jazz play on Thursday. So why on earth? Why on earth would Denver, after Jamal Murray came back and played 21 minutes of the game against the Hawks, why would Jamal Murray be listed probable for this one? So he can sit on Wednesday? Absolute nonsense. Now, unless they finagle this injury report and then a bunch of guys sit on Tuesday, it is nonsensical to me that these guys would play against the Jazz. Why would you do it? What is the purpose of it? You've got a perfect opportunity for a bloke who's current. I know they're tied with the Wolves and they need to win. You will win. You will beat the Jazz. I don't understand why you would get... Like, I had Murray as doubtful. He's probable. Jokic is probable. Gordon is questionable. Um, They chucked a bunch of other um, injury statuses on there. Like, KCP is probable. Porter is probable. Strowther is probable. So they're doing something, but they're probable tags. They're not questionables or doubtfuls. And just, I, I can't help but look at the injury report for Denver and go, why? Why are you doing this? If Aaron Gordon's got a, a messed up foot, if... Murray's dealing with these knee issues and shin splints. Why would they play here? Why would you list them as probable? I think there is still something fishy going on here. Speaking of fishy, Jordan Clarkson, Walker Kessler, Chris Dunn, and John Collins, I all predictably, or I predictively listed them as doubtful, and they're all unbelievably coincidentally ruled out for this game. Shocking. I thought that Christian Brown might get to do a little bit more if Murray was out and Gordon was out, so we'll see. And then for Utah, the last two games, he hasn't started, but Darius Baisley's played 30 minutes. Again, when you are trying to lose, getting a New Balance intern in there is probably a good move. They're not starting him, but he's playing good minutes, so we have to watch it unbelievably. Like, I thought Reggie Jackson would get a boost here because I thought Murray would sit, but apparently not. And then Omer Yetzevan maybe gets a boost, and maybe they let Omer play 30 minutes. Imagine being in a situation where Omer Yurtseven's considered a better player than you and your Darius Baisley. Well, maybe they're not. Maybe Will Hardy's like, I hate the effort you're giving Omer. Darius is doing more, even though it actually leads to more losses on court. They are an absolute lost cause, the Utah Jazz, this season. Speaking of lost causes, the Clippers taking... Oh, actually, no, we're not at the Clippers game. We're not talking about Pelicans. Pelicans and the Blazers. This is the lost cause, the Blazers. Both of these teams go on Thursday this week. Brandon Ingram is out. And this, at the time of me recording, this is the only team that has not um, that is not sent through an injury report. So Ingram is out, but we don't have an update on Najee Marshall. And I went... I went out on a limb and I said that I think Jeremy Grant will be listed doubtful. I thought that would be the case with his hamstring injury. This is absolutely embarrassing for the NBA. They they don't care, but this is embarrassing. There is no situation in the world where Jeremy Grant is listed doubtful with an injury for this long. He might not even be hurt. This team has done this repeatedly. They've made a, a big song and dance in this. Their fake facade player participation policy of looking into injuries at the end of the season. Absolute garbage. They pay no attention to it. None. It's a ridiculous policy that, again, has done nothing, but they'll trumpet that it was awesome. Jeremy Grant is not doubtful with a hamstring injury for 15 consecutive games. The man has never played a game in April. That's not true, but he hasn't played one since 2021. It's ridiculous. Ibubaji is questionable. Simons is still out. Old mate, um, Shaden Sharp's allowed. Now, I don't think that Shaden's going to return now. And at Simons is done. We already talked about that two weeks ago. The dustbuster Dyson Daniels is getting solid enough work as a defensive stat streamer, but the return of Jose Alvaro sort of shrunk him down a little bit. We also want to watch what the hell happens with Valentinus' minutes. And then for Portland, much like when I talked with Denny Avdia in Washington lately, we're seeing so many things come from Delano Banton. Huge usage, big shot attempts, big minutes, running an offense, which on a real team does not work. This team has so many guys out, Simons and Sharp for one, plus another high draft pick coming in. But these are fool's gold type scenarios, I think, but Banton's doing it. We love it for now, but it's just garbage stuff that doesn't really mean much in any sort of context, I don't think. Larry Nance has been getting the boost, but will they limit Valanchunas again so Nance can keep getting boosted? Now, the Pelicans really do need to keep winning because they want to push higher in the standings. 
So we'll see what they do. And then Scoot Henderson, he's playing better. There's going to be bad field goals. We know this. But there are big opportunities for him to continue to put up bigger numbers and boost those stats. The second last game is the Clippers. They are taking on the Phoenix Suns. And we do have the official injury report out for this game. The Clippers and the Suns both do play on Wednesday. So they're on the back-to-back. And Kawhi has been ruled out again with this knee soreness. We hope that he is ready to go because they play Phoenix again on Wednesday. And then they've got the Jazz on Friday, which he definitely won't play. And he probably won't play against the Rockets Sunday, I'm guessing. So I think mm, you might get one game out of Kawhi this week, but I also don't know. Josh Primo is out, or Daniel Tice is listed officially questionable. And for the Suns, it's only Damian Lee who pops up on the injury report. So with Kawhi out, Russell Westbrook keeps getting the boost, keeps getting the minutes jump up. And this is the time that you use Russell Westbrook. You've always got to be cautious of a detonation into your percentages, but he's been playing much better. Well, Bradley Beal, I-, I want to see what he does because it's been up and down. It's been frustrating, but he's putting up very strong numbers at the moment. So let's watch that. I don't think anyone really gets a big boost in Phoenix, but Norman Powell should theoretically get a boost, but it hasn't always been the way um, without Kawhi there. And the last game, Golden State and the Lakers. This game is important in the standings. This is very important because the Warriors are one and a half games behind the Lakers. If you catch the Lakers, you get a chance to move into the nine slot with an outside chance of getting into the eight slot. But in the nine means you get to host the playing game against the Lakers. Now the Lakers, if they get a win, they can jump the Kings. Theoretically, they could jump the Pelicans and get into seven or maybe even jump to get into six ahead of the Suns, but that's unlikely. But they've got a chance to move into the eight slot and get the double chance in the plane. They're only a half game, or sorry, one game behind. No, a half game behind the Kings. Again, they both these teams need to win here. If the Warriors don't win this, then they are locked into 10. They cannot, cannot jump up from 10 here. Steph is back. Rest of the last game. Draymond was on the injury, or left the last game with injury, but he's fine. He's not on the injury report. Wiggins is probable. Gary Payton is probable. So they're all going to be fully healthy, ready to go. Officially, LeBron and AD are listed questionable. I would suggest that given the nature of this game, that both of these guys are going to play. LeBron is listed questionable because his other injuries have all disappeared. They're all gone. LeBron's been on the injury report 75 games this season with ankle issues. not saying it's not real because it is. He's had any ankle problems all season. But now on the injury report, he's questionable illness. The ankle, doesn't not a, not a problem anymore. Same as AD, who's been probable or questionable for 75 games with hip slash Achilles. None of that's on the injury report anymore. It's his eye that's the problem. Everything to me suggests that LeBron and AD play in this game. Gabe Vincent is off the injury report. For the Warriors, the bucket, John Kaminga, came off the bench behind Jackson Davis and Green, even with Wiggins out. So we need to see how they use Kaminga and what his minutes look like. He was still pretty good last game, but that's key to watch. And then for the Lakers, we had a massive one from Jackson Hayes last game. I don't really trust anything that Jackson Hayes does fantasy-wise, but if AD happened to sit, then Hayes would be in, in the mix. Trace Jackson Davis continues to get the boosts, continues to play well, continues to be must roster, and so does Rui Hachimura with Jared Vanderbilt Bar still out and not likely returning really anytime soon. Let's look at um, the back-to-backs. There are a lot of teams playing Tuesday and then Wednesday. I've gone through them all, obviously, but let's give us a succinct list. Atlanta, Charlotte, Dallas, Denver, the Clippers, the Grizzlies, Heat, Bucks, Wolves, Thunder, Magic, Suns, Spurs, Raptors. So it's a lot of teams playing Tuesday and then again on Wednesday. When we're looking to stream in for Yahoo Points Leagues on Tuesday, again, it depends. Do you have the active slots? Can you prioritize a Tuesday-Wednesday combination? That would be good. There are a lot of boosted, boosted guys who you can add who might be better than your seventh guy on your active roster. And that, given how few actual days we can use this week, it might be useful. So Jabari Walker, Scott Pippen, these guys that are italicized are available in over 70% of leagues. Sandro Mamakulishvili, Jordan Goodwin, Grant Williams, and unbelievably, yes, Malzinha Pereira, who probably plays 30 minutes for the Grizzlies team that is full of fake injuries everywhere. On the ESPN side of things, I am going to lean towards Scott Pippen, um, Goodwin, Mamu, that's Mamu Kalishvili, Jabari Walker, Aaron Neesmith, and Vasa Misic, who has a nice little bit of control with his system or valuable over on ESPN, and he's not going to uh, likely to hurt you in the percentages like some of those other guys can. But there are points league guys. If we're in a, a category league, when we're scoring the scoring category, so for points, um, again, italicized is 70% available. 
Non italicized is 50 plus percent. So for scoring, for points, Greg Jackson, G.D. Jackson's there, Scott Pippen's there, Devontae Graham is getting minutes in San Antonio. So yes, he is an option. And then Grant Williams. For threes, we go to Devontae Graham, we go to Sam Hauser, Corey Kispert, and Davis Bertans. The Celtics won, and the status there of Puzingas and Horford will impact quite a bit, but we just don't know those at this point. For rebounds, Jabari Walker is probably the top guy there. Real 20-rebound upside. Um, you've got Malginia Pereira, who's been rebounding well and getting a lot of minutes. You've got Andre Drummond. You've got Sandro Mamakelishvili. Imagine me telling you, this is why we don't play fantasy, that, oh, yeah, your options are going to be Malginia Pereira, uh, Pereira and Sandro Mamakelishvili. And then we have, bro, one of those people isn't even real. What are you talking about? For blocks, Trey Jemison, another guy. You go, this, this is not a real person. But Trey Jemison is going to have to start with Jaron out, and he's a good blocks guy. Taylor Hendricks theoretically would be a good block spot guy for Utah, but they've pulled his minutes back, which makes zero sense, but that's what they've done. Peyton Watson's there for blocks. And then again, we are amazingly talking about Darius Baisley. God. For guard stats, assists, these ones are the easy ones. It's Vasa Misic, it's TJ McConnell, two of the best ones you will find. Then Jordan Goodwin and Trey Mann. This is actually an unbelievable crop of potentially available assist players out there. For steals, Malginia Pereira, Dyson Daniels. Trey Mann and Geordie Goodwin. And then lastly, we look at percentages. We go to Memphis again. This is where the value pops up. Brandon Clark, Jim Wiseman in Detroit. Even though Duran's back, they might limit him. They probably will. You've got Nick Richards, even though he's a backup. You can get some field goal percentage boost. And then the big fella, Trey Jemison. For free throws, Timmy Hardaway, Davis Bertans, Bryce Sensabaugh. And lastly, as we all like to finish, we think about Dylan Brooks as a free throw percentage option. And that brings us to the end of the day. Just tell me down in the comments below, how many times have you finished when you've been thinking about Dylan Brooks? I'm sure it's a common thing. Anyway, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up. There'll be no one watching this part of the show anyway, so no one's going to even get the jokes. So that's all good. Thumb it up and leave those comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See yous. End credit scene. Yusuf Nurkic just got popped onto the injury report as questionable for Phoenix out of nowhere. So there you go. Nurkic, questionable, Suns, bonus content.